Ian Heinish, aka the Hurricane. I'm from Denver, Colorado, and my record is 14 and 3. You know, I had a good upbringing. You know, it was, uh, you know, it was. We lived in a good, good neighborhood. My mom and dad were together. We traveled a lot. We did a lot of fun things, but. Man, I just had like something inside of me that made me so wild, made me so rambunctious and just always questioning the rules and the system and going against the grain. And, um, you know, when I was age 13 and 14 years old, I got prescribed uh, Adderall. And um, that's kind of when the addiction started. And by the age of 17, I had 40 milligrams of Adderall XR and two, two, uh, two, two milligrams of Xanax. And, uh, full-blown addicted to alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, and, and uh, those prescription medications. Later, my parents got divorced and the family kind of fell apart um, when I turned to, to drug dealing. But um, yeah, people knew I was wild, you know? I was, I was a rebel, you know? I always was, and I couldn't settle down. I couldn't do the normal school thing. It wasn't the path for me. So uh, I praise God every day that I found a path that fits uh, my personality and who I am, and it's uh, truly my destiny. Yeah, at one point I was selling 2,000 pills of ecstasy in Denver, Colorado, going to raves and selling to local dealers around the neighborhood. And uh, in 2011, I got set up in a Walmart parking lot, pistol to my head, looking at the sign, uh, just remembering, man, I can't go to prison. I was looking at four to six years, and that's when I, I got a passport issued to me. I posted bail, and, uh, and I, I fled the country. <laughs> Fleeing the country, obviously I was I was 19 years old. I felt like it was my golden years and I felt like going to prison, especially prison in America, crime school as I call it, would be the worst thing I could have done. And so I literally packed up everything I had in a backpack, took a Greyhound to uh, Indiana, said goodbye to my family, took a train to New York. JFK to Amsterdam with about $2,000 in my pocket um, on my own, didn't know anyone. When I got to Amsterdam, um, you know, right back into the partying, you know, I wanted to do things I couldn't do in America, which is with drink absinthe and smoke legal marijuana. And, uh, you know, I just kept getting in trouble, man. And, and eventually I had a cousin who had a friend in Belgium who uh, actually I took a bus out there and he kind of put me up for a little bit until I got a job and got my got my feet under me a little bit in, in uh, Bruges, Belgium. And uh, that only lasted for about eight months. I met this crazy English guy. We ended up getting fired from the job on the same night, basically hosting a party in this guy's bar with their alcohol. And uh, he said, let's go to England, mate. I'll get us a job. And his idea of a job was us sleeping in an apartment with no electricity, no hot water no furniture, nothing. We camped out in this apartment and painted the walls in the day. And uh, it was just not a life I was wanting to live. And that's when eventually I made my way to Tenerife, Spain, the Canary Islands. Once I landed in the Canary Islands, it was paradise for me. I walked along the beach. I remember beautiful women, beautiful people, and uh, just beautiful beaches. And I'm a beach kind of guy. So uh, I made my way down to the club part area. And I actually got hired on the spot to be a PR, which is basically they paid me in drinks. I got eight drinks when I worked, four drinks when I got off work. And I basically just came up to tourists and said, hey, if you guys all buy a drink, I'll get you a free cocktail with a, sh a free shot for everyone. And uh, eventually three months of this, I'm full blown alcoholic, man. I can't even pay 30 euros a month or a week in my rent. And uh, I was sleeping on friends' couches. I was sleeping on the beach. Sometimes when it was really windy, I had to dig a hole so the wind wouldn't hit me when I was sleeping on the beach. And uh, eventually I met this Cuban who was actually born in Miami. And he said, hey, gringo, come live with us, man. We don't want to see you like this. And uh, they took me in like family. And about a few months of me getting sober, the guy, uh, the, the guy sat me down and he said, hey, um, gringo, let's go make some real money. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, Colombia, gringo, Colombia. And that's when we started going down to Colombia, Venezuela, Aruba, 
at picking up the cocaine and transporting it back to Spain. Uh, swallowing a lot of cocaine is, is not very fun, you know. It takes about eight hours to swallow a kilo. You know, you try to do at least 10 to 12 uh, balls uh, an hour and uh, you gotta eat it and then you gotta walk around and you let it start moving down and you know, it's a terrible thing. I think it gave me some GI issues and stuff, but uh, you know, it was a means for survival for me at the time and it was fueling a drug addiction that I couldn't kick on my own and uh, you know, about, I don't know, a 10 to 12 trips. We got we got caught in an airport in, in the, the Canary Islands, taken to the x-ray at the hospital, and x-rayed and saw the balls in my stomach. And uh, yeah, that was it, man. I got a three and a half year sentence and it turned out to be the best thing that could ever happen to me. Prison in the Canary Islands, man, it was, you know, prison anywhere is a terrible thing, but man, they really, really reformed me. I learned Spanish fluent. I found a relationship with Jesus Christ again. Um, and uh, they had a boxing program, they had a wrestling program, their own style of wrestling, Lucha Canaria. And uh, shout out to Juan Espino, he just fought uh, last weekend, he won his fight. I was actually locked up with his father, and his father was my wrestling coach in there. And uh, I, I learned, I grew, I got sober, you know, and uh, I, I realized my dream was not to be uh, locked up or on the run or addicted to drugs. So I made a promise to myself and to God that I was going to come out, become sober, get in the UFC and get that belt. And um, I'm, I'm on my way to do that. 2014, February, um, I got extradited out of Spain. I, I signed a plea that I wouldn't come back to the European Union for five years. So they cut my sentence uh, short by one fourth and uh, extradited me to JFK. And, uh, you know, I ran from some felony warrants. So I, I kind of figured I'm going right back to prison. Little did I know I was going to be held in a Jamaica Queens jailhouse for four days and sentenced to Rikers Island with no bail. You know, Rikers Island, man, I, I remember the judge told me, you're sentenced to Rikers Island and you have no bail. I had no idea what Rikers Island even was until my public defender sat me down and was like, hey, you need to go to protective custody. White boys like you don't make it in Rikers Island. You can't go to normal general population. And you know, I just got out of a two and a half year sentence and I had this mentality of, you throw me at the wolves, I'll lead the pack. So, you know, I didn't go to protective custody and uh, they actually sent me to maximum security. And little did I know it actually was an island. And I remember driving on that long road and you get to the fences and it was one fence after another, after another. And, it, and getting there was like a, uh, uh, it was similar to the smells of, of puke and, and feces at the same time. It was dirty. It was always chaotic. I felt like there was always something going on, a brawl. There was always police officers or guards running to a, an area to uh, try to dissolve the situation. And uh, man, that was one of the, the most survival, scary moments of my life, for sure. Last day I was there, I had an SOS on me. Um, I got into an altercation with a gang and uh, basically an SOS means stab on sight and uh, I tried to go to protect custody at the time but the guards were in on it and they they basically said F you white boy you're in here and uh, I stayed up all night praying man and it was one of the many times God has saved me uh, an hour before those doors open came two big football players looking guys and there was the U.S. Marshal and uh, they pulled me out of there just hours before the door was gonna open and uh, I was gonna be attacked, so praise God for that, man. I did get out of prison, I was still, I was changed for sure, but I wasn't changed fully from the inside until I baptized, got baptized and really submitted my life to God. That's when I was truly changed, but before then, you know, Humans can try to change themselves and it can work for a short amount of time, but to truly change has to be from a higher power, has to be from God to change you from the inside. So I was changed. I had new goals. I had new perspective. I had new, uh, new vision on my life and everything. But, um, you know, I did end up falling back into painkillers after I tore my LCL before my LFA fight. And, um, and then I took my first loss that I've ever taken in my amateur or professional career. And it was the brink of me getting in the UFC. And that's when I could fully surrender to God. I got baptized. And literally two years later, I made it to the top 10 in the UFC, got a UFC contract, met my wife, bought a house. Uh, the blessings just rolled in. And uh, you know, I give, that, I give that to the glory of God for sure.